This is, you know, at the library here, um, probably the first really art exhibit I've done. Um, I've gone to bike shows and had some motorcycle tanks out and done street fairs and craft fairs, stuff like that, but not really so much of an exhibit. I'm uh, pretty much self-taught. Um, I never went to any kind of art college or anything. I would maybe like to attend some kind of master, like uh, apprenticeship, uh, something like that. I've taken, yes, I've t but yes, I work construction and I would come home and just practice. I would read a lot of books back then, you know, I didn't have YouTube or Google, you know. Uh, so yeah, you know, when you, I believe that when you want something and you're passionate about it, uh, you'll stop at nothing. I think it was more in my blood. I, it wasn't, you know, ever since my mother said I could pick up a pencil, I started drawing. I don't know if it was as much as in the beginning, my father's influence as it is. I think art is almost like hereditary. I notice a lot of artists, like my son now is an artist and my granddaughter at four, five is now showing signs of being an artist interest. So I think a lot of artists um, are art. My mother was a, a, a sculptor and a dressmaker. So um, having two parents who are creative, I think also. My father was uh, my mentor and my inspiration. Uh, he had a sign in his studio, he was a commercial artist, and it said, Stephen Patrick Moran, the greatest artist in the world. And for a four and five year old, that was pretty, uh, you know, intimidating. So I said, Dad, what if I don't become an artist, you know? He goes, but you will, don't you feel it? And you know, I did, I felt it in my bones. Like I've just always known. And I don't remember a time I wasn't drawing. I sold my first painting in second grade. My teacher called my parents and said, you know, your son's real talented. I know someone with a gallery. Would you be interested in making money? They declined. I made like six bucks. At my first paintings, I did my thumbprint. I have a, cut my thumb off, a very unique thumbprint. So I did a little marching band, sold in the first couple of weeks. I got like six bucks, bought some candy. But for a seven-year-old, I was pretty thrilled. So that's what kind of started it all. Um, but, uh, you know, the greatest artist in the world, I said, you know, just find greatness, you know. You know, and uh, you know, having family and friends and things like that can be great. And he goes beside you, my son. <laughs> so he was a big influence. But everyone used to always say, you know, uh, you'll never be an artist. That's one of a million, you know, kind of talking you out of your dreams. And uh, I just never gave up. You know, my father always had a saying, it's been with me for the rest of my whole life. And it's uh, the good, the better, the best. Never let it rest. The good become the better and the better become the best. I was influenced by a lot of Marvel comics, cartoons. I loved horror and creatures and monsters, so I always drew uh, monsters and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why I love skulls. You know, my whole thing is skulls now. Um, I've been known for that, doing the motorcycle tattooing industry for years. Um, I, I look at the skull as a positive that sees the day, sees the moment. You know, it's like that whole Grim Reaper is not uh, doom and gloom. He just represents time. He's the god Thanos and he represents time. And that time is very valuable, very precious to take every day and seize that moment. Yes, I uh, suffered a pec tear um, uh, and uh, benching 450 pounds, my, my chest actually tore off my shoulder. I had to have it bolted back on. Uh, I do have a, a, a scar and a divot, which my benching wasn't able to go as high. So um, it did kind of end that. Uh, you know, I go to the gym um, five, at least five days a week. Uh, I don't know how much body building I'm doing as body maintaining at this point. I was ordained a deacon uh, in my church uh, years ago. And my pastor came to me and said, Steve, I want you to study religion so you know what you're talking about. I decided instead of just studying Catholicism because I was raised Irish Catholic that I would study Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Scientology and uh, all religions, Judaism, you name it, uh, not just one. And I got audio books and just obsessive compulsive went into it and uh, yeah, I, 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 it was a lot of history, philosophy, psychology, um, a lot of quantum physics and who we are and that's what I believe art is. It's energy. We're all energy. We're all vibrations. I found out that there's a lot more going on here than we realize. If I was to sum up my 25 years of research, 
there's a lot more going on than we realized. And art is energy. I feel that colors um, are vibrations, red, blue, they all vibrate at different frequencies. And that's what I try to convey. I feel that we should surround ourselves with plants, uh, music, poetry, art, to increase our own vibrations. My dad used to have a, a, a saying about vibrations. He says that there's roses, art is like roses, there's felt roses, silk roses, and they look so real, and now they can replace those plastic stems with like a real stem, and they can spray fragrance, and you can't notice the difference, and they last forever. So why would you spend money on a real rose that's just gonna die? But if someone's sick or in the hospital, or you love, that's why it's a symbol of love, a, a real rose has so much vibration, so much energy, that silk roses have their place but you would give somebody a real rose even though they would die. And I believe art is a lot like that, it, that vibration. And that's how I try to explain it, is like a silk rose. You can buy, you know, prints and things like that, but a real rose, uh, that vibration uh, is where it's at. Yes, I've heard um, several times that when people first see me, they get that biker, maybe gym rat kind of persona. And then when they hear me, they find out, you know, you're an artist, you know, I was a head bouncer for 25 years. I, I don't consider myself just one thing, you know, as you were in high school, you had your greasers, your rockers, your socials, your jocks. I wrestled, like you said, I bodybuild martial arts. Um, I, I never considered myself one or the other. Then I'm an art, see, I'm kind of a nerd, really. I love chess and things like, like you say. I've had people with my website say, you know, your website looks a little bikerish. I've been called a biker and I take that with a little bit of offense. You know, um, I'm not a biker, you know. Uh, I did have a chopper, I had a couple bikes. I was in a biker group, I have to admit. But um, then uh, my bikers would say, you know, I see your website and it looks a little soft. I see some butterflies and airbrushing and things on there. So I almost need those two personas, you know. Um, but yeah, I feel with art, um, it's important to have a mix, to be able to accommodate all different people. I'm not limited to one, th I don't like to just be a landscape artist or a portrait artist, but as you said, with the soft of the airbrushing, I, that's why I like painting a little bit. Uh, it's more uh, painterly, dippling and dabbling. Uh, I can do hyper photorealistic, but I kind of like that painterly look, those drips, those splatters. So I use a little airbrushing and a little paint now, a little bit more so. Yes, I did, I, I, I drew them. Of course, I didn't tattoo them, but there's a samurai and uh, a, a Viking. And why I like them so much is they had the philosophy of burn the bones. There is no retreat. You know, the Vikings believed that if they died in battle, they went to Valhalla and then fought in the, the wars of, of their Odin, their god. And the Samurais believed the same, that they would actually kill themselves if they didn't die in battle. So they weren't going home for disgrace. So I kind of believe that, you know, as I say, you know, burn the boats. Uh, there is no plan B. I saw an airbrushing years ago of a man doing vans and motorcycles and things. And I thought that was a cool way to get your art out there on the road. You know, everyone's seeing it, driving around. What exposure would that be? I know back in the day, graffiti artists would tag trains for the same reason, because they knew they were going to travel from city to city, you know. Uh, so I thought that was a great way of great exposure. But once I started airbrushing, uh, the versatility of it actually helped me become an artist because I could do clothing. I could do body painting, and I've done body painting for celebrities, America's top model, Michael Jackson, Michael Bolton, and the NFL. Um, so I did a lot of body painting. Yes, I did um, um, at the uh, uh, plaza in New York. I did some body painting for him for a party he was having. And I got to meet him, he was there with his kids. And, and he was, uh, you know, he was taller than I thought. I don't know if he was wearing platform shoes, but, uh, and he was a strange, you know, you see him on TV, but to see him in person, very pale, he wore makeup to kind of almost, uh, give his features, and he loved everything we did. I went to a uh, airbrush action getaway years ago, and they had a little vial of, uh, it was a attempt to makeup paint, very little. At that time, it was experimental. But they used it in the movie Cape Fear with Robert De Niro to, so they could apply his tattoos, and the actor could take showers and not have to reapply it every time. So I got a little bit of it, and I drew a rose on a friend's leg. 
and a florist saw it and said, could you do that on someone's whole body? And I said, well, if they had held still long enough, you know, so we had a few models, did some experimenting. I practiced with different makeups until I perfected it. And he actually opened a company called Bodycast back in the day where um, me and several other artists would work with him. company at the time and I would get rolls of fabric and I would do little drills dot to dots they called them dagger strokes um, and I did it for um, about six months and I took an airbrush course and a, uh, uh, an instructor called Terry Hill um, may he rest in peace uh, kind of mentored me a little bit he said Steve he was looking at my work I want you to go back to drills for six months I'm like six months I'm like you know that's a lot you know I'm obsessive you talk to you just do that and I did and after the six months, I found it was like throwing an apple on uh, a woman's head, you know, uh, a knife at a, uh, or an arrow. You're going to hit that apple 99.9% .9 of the time because you have practiced enough. And once the airbrush wasn't uh, cumbersome and I could focus on my artwork, it was no longer a challenge. And then that's when I saw my artwork take off. Airbrushing is very odd because you never touch the surface you're on an invisible plane before the surface, so you're watching everything transpire. So that's a little tricky. You have to really get used to that. Then when I tattooed, it was the opposite because you're actually carving into the skin. And you know, when people see me, they think I'm a big guy and I have a heavy hand. They're like, oh no, he's not tattooing me. You know, but and actually you know, it's the opposite. When I first started tattooing, they would be like, ah, I would pull away. And my tattoos were very light. And after a while, I was like, you know what, Rob, they want this, you know, you know kind of. But I had to learn to give more of a pressure as opposed to staying back. So it was complete opposite. I have a mind that doesn't shut off. You know, I'm your typical artist. Uh, I'm constantly thinking, constantly, you know, overthinking. Uh, but once I hit that brush to that canvas, the world shuts off. And I think that's been a big, um, savior in my life is that I'm able to block out some of the negativities uh, in, in my life and just focus on, on art therapy. I feel that that's one of the, the blessings to being an artist is to look at a blank canvas and to be able to create something in your mind and your imagination to bring it forth from just a thought into reality. Um, that manifestation, uh, I feel that's one of the most wonderful things like a song or anything to do. Some of the most important things with art is composition, uh, geometry. Uh, it's all around us, like I said, that whole vibrational. People don't realize they think everything is a chaos mix, but everything is very, very fundamental. <laughs> uh, I like an acrylic base. It's just cheaper, dries quicker. And then an oil, I love oils now. Um, uh, I took a course uh, with uh, Kevin Murphy. Uh, he's a great, he has a, a, a course an online of all artists that uh, he went down to fundamentals. He like was telling me how to hold a pencil. I'm like, really? You know, like you're gonna tell me how to hold a pencil? But when he explained, you know, the, the, the tip of the pencil with the paper and how the lead falls into the grains, it helped me with my tattooing. Because my tattooing was multiple needles and there's something called bruising, where you just bruise the skin and then you, then you apply the paint, uh, the ink. Um, so yeah, it, it helped me a lot. His course, just that, Going back to fundamentals. I do like a little artistic freedom, like give me a direction, show me what you're into, and then that way it can kind of lead me down a path so I'm not just guessing at what you like. But um, yeah, I, it's weird because I do like to draw from my head. I feel you become a little more creative, but everyone says get references, get references. I feel sometimes too many references divert us from our imagination, but we are, taking imaginations and thoughts from things we've seen, but I feel you can become a little bit more uh, expressive when you don't have too many guidelines. I do teach at the Greenbrier Woodlands. I'm in a community, um, some great students there. Um, I just like to uh, help people with art. Um, I love teaching. I love, I could talk for hours about art, and, um, but I'd like to start giving some more classes, yeah. I had people just go ahead, draw, on my arm, um, I would use Sharpies and just start freehanding, draw. I did a lot of freehanding, a lot of cover-ups um, where I worked. Um, but yeah, I would just draw and they'd look in the mirror and be like, go for it. 
You know, they love to, I've had people with motorcycles just say, here, Steve, here's a couple thousand dollars, do your thing. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, give me some direction. You know, um, what are you into? You know, well, what are you into? Well, I like skulls and dragons and demons and things like that. And they're like, great, go for it. And uh, it was, you know, I love clients like that. I did have a gentleman drive all the way up from Maryland to get a t-shirt. Uh, it was a sweatshirt, actually. I kind of laughed because I was like, wow, you came all the way from Maryland for a t-shirt? Isn't there any ever artists down there? And he said, no. And uh, he said that he got in a fight with his fiance. It was one of those double hearts with the names on them. You know, those are great because you can always do more and more of those, you know. Uh, but he had tore it in half, I think. And, um, you know, she was all upset. So he wanted to get it replaced, redone, you know. And he would travel from Maryland to get it done. I just thought that was kind of funny. You know, it's funny with fine art because I'm caught in a, a little bit of a threshold, like I said, going to the beachy, shorey thing, um, where you want something that looks good in someone's living room above their couch. So if their couch is blue, you want to keep it blue and you want to keep it simple, as opposed to what I'd really like to do, you know, with some kind of weird octopus, you know, lighthouse uh, uh, chula creature or something. Uh, I don't think that would be for everybody, but maybe one day I'll find my niche. I, I feel they understand that an artist needs to uh, enjoy what he's doing because you're going to do a better job at it, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been doing it for 37 years, as I said, I mean, um, you know, or all my life. So my aspiration would be to paint what I want to paint, um, to spend a few months having financial freedom, to be able to do whatever I wanted to do and hopefully find somebody who would uh, appreciate it to want that in their living room, regardless of what color their couch was. As I said, there's more going on in the world than people realize, and I want people to understand that. Um, as I was telling you, I suffered a stroke a year ago, and I couldn't draw. And the weirdest thing about that, my mother, who was 91 at the time, uh, we didn't speak much, maybe a year, uh, once or twice a year. I know it's bad. We should have talked more to mom, but we do now every day. But that night, uh, I got up in the middle of the night and I was sick, and I was going to call an ambulance. And she called me. It was two missed messages when I came back from the bathroom. Uh, uh, from my 91-year-old, why was she calling me at 2 o'clock in the morning? She was hysterical crying, Stephen, what's wrong? I said, what do you mean, what's wrong? She goes, you called me. She made me question myself. I, I said, I didn't call you. And she checked the caller ID. My stepfather's like, Ann, go back to bed, you're dreaming. She said, oh my God, I spoke to you, it seems so real. And it changed my life because I realized that, ah, wow, well, did she know? Mother's intuition. Like, there truly is more going on here than we really know. I think I was always creative and um, curious, you know. Um, but my father used to always show me things with life, how to look at life as an artist. You know, a lot of people just walk past the tree. I was talking about this with my students. I feel an artist stops, touches the tree, pulls a leaf off, grabs a branch, maybe makes that branch and draws on a painting of the tree uh, and, and, and uses the green of the leaf and the, and the, the stick for, uh, you know, an artist will see things and do things differently. And how to do that when you, know, you walk into a room, like to stop and smell the roses. Some people would actually just go, okay, I did that. No, 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 stop. Smell the roses, look at the roses, hold the roses, you know, really appreciate them and their color. Um, it's, it's a different kind of a philosophy. So I think that philosophy led me down uh, a religious, spiritual, I don't necessarily call myself religious, I call myself spiritual. Yeah. I believe that with all my uh, setbacks, that uh, everyone said, I will be one of a million, you'll never be an artist, you'll never make money out of it, if you love it, fine. I believe that if I can, if I can do that, then anyone else can do what they want in, in their lives and, and their, their dreams, no matter what it is, even if it's the simple thing of, and I know like just struggling, just surviving can be a creative process. I do hope that if they hear my story or they do see it, that they feel those vibrations, they do say, wow, look at this guy. You know, he's one of a million, as they say. Um, maybe I should start doing that sculpting, that drawing, or that taking that cooking class, or whatever it is that they wanted to do. Um, and uh, just, you know, um, believe that if I can do it, 
Benedict. Support public libraries. Like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.